Today, 150 years since the start of the Civil War, over 60,000 books have been written on its battles, generals, soldiers, causes, influences, and consequences. Between 2008 and 2009, in anticipation of, of the bicentennial of Lincoln's birth, almost 100 books were written on our 16th president. The American Civil War biography, bibliography includes Pulitzer Prize winners, includes classics written by McPherson, Foote, Catton, Wills, Neely, Grant, Sears, Goodman, and many, many others. The standard for greatness in this field is well established. Our next author, Mr. James Swanson, has shot to the top of the list of contemporary and Civil War authors. In 2009, in Newsweek magazine, Patricia Cornwell named Swanson's Manhunt and, and Truman Capote's In Cold Blood as the two best nonfiction crime books ever. In 2006, Entertainment Weekly magazine named his book Manhunt, Manhunt one of the 10 best books of the year. His awards include the 2007 Edgar Award. Mr. Swanson's Manhunt was a New York Times bestseller. His recent book, Bloody Crimes, The Chase for Jefferson Davison and the Death Pageant for Lincoln's Corpse has won praise from his contemporary Lincoln author authorities. I think the reason Mr. Swanson's books stand out is, it, is his riveting writing style that keeps you on the edge of your seat and one which conveys his passion for honest aid. In Bloody Crimes, he writes, the real Mary Lincoln was mercurial, jealous, insulting, rude, selfish, deceitful, paranoid, and financially dishonest, and without a doubt, mentally unbalanced. Can Mary Lincoln be more succinctly explained or met Mr. Swanson's message be any clearer? In the end, even though, as in Manhunt, you know the story, you know that Booth meets his inn in a barn in Virginia, you will flip the pages like a, like a Grisham thrillers until you read the conclusion and learn something new about a subject that is seemingly well known. In Bloody Crimes, Mr. Swanson weaves the story of two presidents, Lincoln and Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor that I get to, to introduce Lincoln Authority and a superb Civil War author, Mr. James Swanson. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read this Blackberry. I'm just putting it out to see the time so I don't talk too long. Uh, so I'm not going to be reading messages while I'm, I'm speaking. Although if Lincoln was here today, he would have up here a Blackberry, a Mac Air. He was addicted to the, uh, the new technologies. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about today, how I got into this, why I did these books, uh, how I ended up doing Bloody Crimes. When I attend author events, I really don't like to hear authors read from their books. I, I find that very boring. And I'd rather know about them and the backstory, what they learned from doing a book, why they did the book, how they got into writing. So I thought I'd talk for just a couple of minutes how I got into all this, and then talk about why I did Bloody Crimes as the sequel to Manhunt. I really got involved in the Lincoln story on my birthday, uh, February 12th, which is Lincoln's birthday. And I was born in Illinois, Lincoln country, in Chicago. And from a time I, I can't remember, I was given comic books and trinkets and gifts and other things. And I remember when I was a boy, I would also visit the Chicago Historical Society, which has on display the actual bed in which Lincoln died. Yes, it was taken away from Washington. A Chicago candy millionaire paid $100,000 for the Lincoln deathbed in the early 1900s and moved it to Chicago. But I, I visited that. And I really got interested in the assassination when I was 10 years old. And that's when my grandmother, who was a veteran of the last era or the last moments of the tabloid newspaper age in Chicago, that great Ben Hecht era, gave me an interesting gift for my 10th birthday. And uh, not a bicycle, not, not a new bat, not a new baseball glove. She gave me a framed engraving of John Wilkes Booth's Derringer pistol that he had used to kill Abraham Lincoln. And framed with that engraving was part of a clipping from the Chicago Tribune uh, from the morning of April 15, 1865, which was the morning that Lincoln had died. And I remember reading those headlines, because in those days there was not one big, broad, horizontal headline in a newspaper. The left column would have a series of descending headlines. And I remember reading the president shot, dying, 
Secretary of State Seward stabbed. Booth, the actor, the assassin, leaps to the stage, cries out, six separate Tyrannus, then the South is avenged, runs out the back door, and, and at that point, someone had cut that clipping off in mid-sentence. <laughs> and I, I hung that on my bedroom wall, and I remember saying to myself as a child, as I read that story hundreds of times, it became a, a Citizen Kane, like Rosebud type sled for me. Read it over and over again, and I said, I have to know what happened. I have to know the rest of that story. And that really began my interest in Lincoln. So from age 10, I've been collecting books, artifacts, autographs, relics, paintings, prints, anything related to the life or death of Abraham Lincoln. It really was not my intention to write the Manhunt book at all. I wrote it by accident. And, and here's how that happened. Uh, my agent said to me, well, what do you want to do next? And I said, when I was a little boy, when I was seven or eight years old, my grandmother told me, did you know that during the 1893 World's Fair, there was an insane madman doctor who murdered over 100 girls and dissolved their bodies in acid? And remember, I, I was seven or eight when I was told about this madman doctor d murdering girls and dissolving them in acid. There are a couple girls in my elementary school I wanted to dissolve in acid. So I, I remember that story very well. So I told my agent, when I was a boy, my grandmother told me this great story about this madman doctor who did this and this, and I want to do that. And he said, have you ever heard of Eric Larson? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, I happen to know that Eric Larson is in the middle of writing a book now that will be called Devil in the White City and is exactly the story that your grandmother told you. So you've got to come up with something else. <laughs> I said, well, I've got it. Uh, when my father was a boy going to Lane Tech High School in Chicago it, during World War II, people, teachers would point at a desk and say, do you see that desk? At that desk sat Herbert Hans Haupt, one of the eight Nazi saboteurs landed by U-boat on American shores in 1942. And then I had a personal interest in the story because when I served in uh, the Reagan administration, I worked at the Department of Justice, and my office was not far from the Attorney General's office. And when you walked out the front door of my office, you'd see a bronze plaque outside another door. And that plaque said, in this room were tried by military tribunal, the eight Nazi saboteurs. And so I called my dad and said, you won't believe it. The, the, the room in which Haupt was tried is right opposite my office at Department of Justice. So I told my agent all of this and said, I want to write about the eight Nazi saboteurs. And the guy who went to my dad's high school, who was executed uh, for coming back to America. And my agent, Richard, said, well, unlike the problem with Eric Larson, and the book you wanted to write about uh, the maniacal doctor. There is no one person writing a book about the eight Nazi saboteurs. There are three different authors that are all writing three different books about the eight Nazi ta saboteurs. And because of this, they're all going to cancel each other out, and none of their books are going to sell. So you cannot write the fourth book about the Nazi saboteurs. Uh, my grandfather also loved to tell me horrible stories. He was on the Chicago Police Department from the uh, early 1930s, the Al Capone and gangster era, through the late 1960s, the Vietnam protest era and the civil rights protest era. And I remember one day my grandfather came home and I heard him whisper to my family, don't let Jamie read the newspaper tonight. So of course, what's the first thing I did was sneak a copy of the Chicago Sun-Times. Now, does anyone here remember the name of Richard Speck? The, the, the maniac who killed those eight or nine student nurses one by one with a knife uh, in their apartment in Chicago in the middle of the night. And my agent said, well, you've got me there. No one is writing a book about Richard Speck, but do you want to spend the next two years of your life with him and have him inside your head? And I said, I, I don't really. And then he said, what else have you got? And I said, well, I've always been interested in the story of the murder of Abraham Lincoln, the first assassination of an American president, and then the 12-day manhunt for his killer. And then I'm also interested in another book on, and he said, wait, wait, go back to that manhunt thing. Uh, 
he said, do you like that as much as the other stories? And I, I, I said, yeah, I, I really love that story. And he said, why don't you do that Manhunt book? I, I think I could sell that one. And so uh, that's how I ended up doing it. It was my fourth idea. And uh, I, I did Manhunt by default because other writers had taken the other two. And uh, I decided I didn't want to do the, uh, the spec book. Uh, when I did Manhunt, I had not planned on doing a sequel. I thought that was the story in itself. But at a number of book events, people would ask, well, tell us more about what happened after that. Because in Manhunt, I mentioned very briefly, in a sentence or two, that on the morning that John Wilkes Booth is shot and killed, thousands of people are lining up in Albany, New York, to view Lincoln's corpse. And I mentioned in a sentence or two that while the hunt for Booth is going on, there's also a chase for Jefferson Davis. And I realized that there was really a trilogy of three great stories that happened in the spring of 1865. And I'd really covered one of them in Manhunt, uh, the killing of Lincoln and the pursuit of Booth. And the other two were what happened to Lincoln after he was dead, that final journey. And then what happened to Jefferson Davis, not only during his escape and capture, but for the next quarter century. And so I decided that these three stories together were, were very important American journeys. To me, as important in a certain way as the journey of Lewis and Clark, or the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, or even the journey to the moon. Because all these journeys have led to great American myths and, and memories that influence our history and our culture and our politics to this day. So I decided to, to go ahead and do the, uh, the Bloody Crimes book to complete the story. Uh, what interested me was that I came to the conclusion that Jefferson Davis is one of the true lost men of American history. And prior to 1861, there can be no doubt that before the Civil War, uh, Jefferson Davis would have to be considered one of the great American heroes who today is completely forgotten or disdained. And one of the fun things about doing the book was to discover how much Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis had in common, especially earlier in their lives. I was really astonished by some of these parallels, and I'll, I'll mention a few now. Both men, born in Kentucky, less than 100 miles apart, both in log cabins. Um, as young men, both were rambunctious and boisterous. Uh, Jefferson Davis learned to wrestle from slaves. Abraham Lincoln became a champion wrestler on the Illinois frontier. Uh, both men uh, went against the grain. They challenged authority. Uh, at West Point, Jefferson Davis was most, almost expelled twice for drinking and fighting and disobeying. And while Abraham Lincoln was never a drinker, uh, Abraham Lincoln was certainly the filthiest storyteller who ever lived in the White House. I, I always like to say to people who criticize Abraham, um, uh, Richard Nixon, listen to those tapes, listen to that foul language. Nixon was a priest compared to uh, Abraham Lincoln's filthy, dirty stories that he loved telling throughout his entire life. Uh, and he also had, uh, didn't accept authority well, just like Jefferson Davis. Um, both men served in the Black Hawk Indian War in Illinois and in Wisconsin. Uh, Jefferson Davis, as an officer in the regular army, who was actually put in charge of the captured war chief Black Hawk. And interestingly, when whites came to laugh at Black Hawk after he'd been handcuffed and put in a cage, Jefferson Davis became furious and ordered them away. And later Black Hawk said that Jefferson Davis was a man of great honor and a, and a war chief for, for protecting his dignity. Uh, Abraham Lincoln saw no combat at all in the uh, Black Hawk War. He was the elected uh, captain of a company of militia. Uh, during his one unsuccessful term in Congress, Lincoln did say on the floor of Congress, oh yes, I did many a bloody battle with the insects and the mosquitoes during that war. Uh, one thing that they had deeply in common, profoundly in common, changed who they were and really made them the men they were. They, in adulthood, they were brooding men. They were fatalists. They could be depressed. Uh, they mourned uh, uh, the passage of time, loss, death. And I think much of that comes from what happened to them in the early 1830s. In the case of Abraham Lincoln, her name was Anne Rutledge. 
And for the past 180 years, since the 1830s, Mary Lincoln's apologists, beginning with Mary herself, have tried to smother out the story of who Ann Rutledge was and what she meant to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, she was a few years younger than Lincoln. He was awkward with women. They started spending time together. The villagers would see them go on walks or have conversations or socialize or she would visit him at his store or at the, at where he was also the postmaster. And the villagers all saw and later remembered the obvious signs of courtship from that time in history. And only one physical thing today links uh, Lincoln and Ann Rutledge. Uh, she was illiterate, and today at the Library of Congress, there's a book of grammar on which Abraham Lincoln's handwriting appears on the title page, and it says, Ann Rutledge is now learning grammar. Lincoln was teaching her how to read. She became ill and died after a few days from a sudden illness. And Lincoln's friends thought he would go insane or lose his mind. His closest friend thought that Abraham Lincoln would commit suicide. This is in the early 1830s because of the death of Ann Rutledge. They even took away Lincoln's razors for shaving because they feared he actually might slit his own throat or cut his wrists because he was so devastated at the loss of this girl. Uh, we have no idea what she looked like. It was just the dawn of photography in Europe and certainly on the Illinois frontier in the 1830s who would have thought to take an expensive photo portrait of a, p of a poor, illiterate girl? And who would have thought to paint a painting of her or to do a sketch of her? And uh, one of the few descriptions of her that ever survived uh, comes from her brother years later when asked by one of Lincoln's law partners, what would she like? Tell me their story. Her brother said, oh, she was fair and had blue eyes. Once Lincoln left that town of New Salem, as far as we can determine, he never spoke of her again to anyone. No one in Washington, D.C., when he's president, had even ever heard her name. In the case of Jefferson Davis, her name was Sarah Knox Taylor. She went by the name of Knox. She was the daughter of General Zachary Taylor, who was to become Davis's future commander in the Mexican War. And Jeff and Davis met Jeff and Knox met when she was in her teens, and uh, the, the Taylors did not want them to marry, not so much because they didn't like him, but because they didn't want their favorite daughter to endure the tough life of an army officer's wife on the western frontier in the 1830s. They exchanged a vivid correspondence for two years, and then they reunited, and Davis resigned from the army so he could marry her. And they did get married, and he took her home to Mississippi and then to his sister's plantation there. And it's there on their honeymoon that they both became infected by a particularly virulent form of malaria uh, brought over by slaves two centuries before. Both almost died. Uh, Davis came out of his fever, and he heard Knox singing from her sickbed uh, her favorite song. So he rushed to her bed cradled her in his arms, and she died. And she was 21 years old, and they had been married for 12 weeks. Davis then went into what he called, quote, my great seclusion, close quote, where for several years he left the world behind. He lived on his plantation with his slaves, with his hired black overseer. Strangely, one of Davis's lifelong friends was a black man he hired to run his business affairs and plantation and uh, was, was most unusual for a planter in the South to do that. And also Davis's brother lived next door on his plantation, and he spent the next several years reading, writing, thinking, studying politics, studying history and art and philosophy. He emerged from the world again to marry Verena Howell, uh, daughter of a Mississippi family. And here's a big difference now between them. Unlike Abraham Lincoln, who went on to marry Mary Todd, uh, Jefferson Davis married very well in choosing Verena Davis, and she was a great lifelong companion and ally of his, and they had several children. Many differences between them also. Uh, Jefferson Davis went to two colleges, went to West Point. Abraham Lincoln was a graduate of the first grade. Jefferson Davis read thousands of books, 
Abraham Lincoln probably read several hundred. They looked the same. Uh, think of the photographs you've seen of each man. That, that tall, hollow-cheeked, cadaverous look. Uh, Lincoln was the taller man, but Davis looked very tall because of that ramrod straight bearing. He learned it at West Point. They weren't really interested in the pleasures of the world. They weren't er interested in fine food and eating. They weren't collectors of fine furniture or artworks. Um, they weren't men who were attracted to luxuries. They were more men of the mind. Um, neither one was a hothead. Um, both were intellectual and, and rationalists, and they reasoned things out and reasoned things through rather than adopt positions quickly or in anger. Both had the X factor that today we'd call a kind of star quality. You see it in, in movie stars today or, or charismatic politicians. If you met Jefferson Davis or Abraham Lincoln, you'd never forget that you met them. Uh, they had an interesting look. They had an interesting aura. They were great public speakers for different reasons. Lincoln had this high, keening, piercing Kentucky accent, and Davis had the smoother, melodious southern accent that, that uh, is almost a stereotype today. Uh, but that's how he reached people. Uh, both went into politics. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had one unsuccessful term as United States congressman where he tried to provoke and embarrass President Polk for starting the Mexican War. Lincoln accused Polk of faking the Mexican War by lying about where American troops first encountered the Mexican army. Uh, Lincoln kept saying, I demand to know the spot on which the first encounter occurred. And back home, that earned Lincoln the nickname of Spotty Lincoln. And uh, think of it in terms of the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. Where was it that the American forces first encountered the forces of Vietnam at sea? And there was controversy about where did that happen. Um, that's what Lincoln was doing uh, at the time of the Mexican War. Uh, he did not volunteer to uh, return to military ser service. Jefferson Davis, on the other hand, was a congressman, a U.S. senator, one of our greatest secretaries of war in history. He left Congress to raise a regiment, the Mississippi Rifles, and he personally led them into combat in multiple battles in the Mexican War. He was wounded in action, refused to leave the field, and came home a great war hero. Jefferson Davis was a spokesman for an entire region of the nation. Um, Abraham Lincoln, in his early career, was an ex a spokesman for a congressional district in Illinois. If in the 1850s, maybe as late as the early 1858, before the Lincoln-Douglas debates happened that summer, if you had asked an average American to put aside for a moment their party preference, whether Whig, the new fangled Republican Party, or, or Democrat, and just ask them to make an outright prediction, who one day will be a future president of the United States, Jefferson Davis or Abraham Lincoln? The majority of people, I'm convinced, would have said, well, obviously, Jefferson Davis. And many would have said, Abraham who? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was a local celebrity in Illinois in the 1840s and early 1850s. He was a well-known lawyer, but he was not one of the great constitutional lawyers like Daniel Webster arguing before the Supreme Court. Abraham Lincoln, for half of his practice, was a debt collector. I remember I gave a lecture uh, last year on Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer at the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, the justices were stunned uh, when, I, when I described the limitations of Lincoln law practice. He defended murderers, whores, thieves, arsonists, liars, killers, bigamists, and half his practice was really collecting bad debts. He was a brilliant thinker but he was not an illustrious, famed lawyer at the top of his game nationwide. And if Lincoln didn't get involved in the slavery controversy again in 1854, I think we might not have ever heard of Abraham Lincoln again. Another interesting thing in common, uh, and another sadness, uh, in 1862, Abraham Lincoln's favorite son, Willie, died in the White House. And one of my favorite parts of the Bloody Crimes book is my extended description of the illness and the death and aftermath of Willie Lincoln. Uh, it was certainly the worst thing that ever happened to Lincoln. 
And if anyone in Washington had known him in those New Salem days in Illinois in the 1830s, they certainly would have seen all those familiar signs of his breakdown. And uh, it devastated him. A couple years later, in 1864, Jefferson Davis was at his office in the old Customs House in Richmond. And a messenger rushed to his office and said, Mr. President, you have to come home right now. Something's happened to your boy. One of Davis's sons was playing on the second floor balcony of the Confederate White House, and he fell to the pavement. And when Davis got home, he saw that the boy had a fractured skull, a crushed chest, and broken bones. And there was only time for Davis to hold his son in his arms, look in his eyes, and he died. That sent him back to the 1830s, to the death of his beloved Sarah, just as Willie's death sent Lincoln back to the 1830s and, and brought him back to the death of Ann Rutledge. Then, of course, for the, the remainder of the Civil War, each of these presidents laid his head on his pillow, less than 100 miles apart, the same circumstances in which they had been born, as each man uh, dreamed of uh, saving his country. And those are just some of the interesting parallels and differences. Uh, there are two, there's one ultra similarity and one ultra difference between Lincoln and Davis that I think trump all others. Um, the ultimate difference between them is their belief of the nature of man. Who, who is man? What is a man? Wh what is freedom? Uh, Abraham Lincoln once wrote, and always believed, um, if slavery is not wrong, he said, then nothing is wrong. And Lincoln had said, if, if so I would not be a slave, I would not be a master. Lincoln believed that all people of any race or color were entitled to equal protection of the laws. As an aside, Abraham Lincoln was not an egalitarian that we would recognize today. Abraham Lincoln never believed in equality. N Lincoln never believed in equality of result. Lincoln believed only in equal rights under the law and equal opportunities. Jefferson Davis believed the opposite. He believed that slavery was not only lawful, which he was absolutely correct, it had been enshrined in the Constitution, but he believed it was a positive good. Davis and other leading Southern planters and, and, and ministers argued that slavery took a heathen, uncivilized people and made them civilized and Christianized them. So they persuaded themselves they were actually helping the slaves. And Davis believed that in no lawful way could the states of the North prevent the extension of slavery into new territories. That was really the nub of the issue in 1861. Not so much will slavery exist or not. Everyone believed that slavery was lawful and had a right to exist. In Lincoln's 1861 inaugural address, he said, and I'm paraphrasing, I recognize the lawful of slavery, and I shall do nothing, nothing, to attempt to free those slaves. But I insist that slavery not be expanded into the new territories as they become states. People have asked me, did they know each other? Were they friends? C could they have avoided this great war? Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis not only did not know each other, they'd never met, they never even laid eyes on each other, even though for a brief period of, of several months in Washington, their, their time there had, uh, had uh, overlapped. The great similarity between Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis is this, uh, and in this, I believe they're identical, I believe they are the same. As I said earlier, neither man was a hothead, neither man rushed into a position. Uh, Davis loved the North. He traveled North widely. Davis was given an honorary degree at Bowdoin College, later from which came uh, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, that great Union officer at the Battle of Gettysburg. Davis had once said, with your great industry and our great agriculture, we will conquer this continent. Davis was not an avid secessionist. He thought secession was a bad idea. He was not one of the hotheads who was rushing to leave the Union. He advised his fellow Southerners this could be a very bad idea and the South could suffer much from it. But once Davis adopted a position, he would not change his mind. It, once he concluded that he was right, he would not retract. 
And in the same way, that's true of Abraham Lincoln. We have this completely false image today of grandfatherly father Abe, always wanting to compromise. Often politicians today say, well, we should be like Lincoln. We should compromise. Well, once Lincoln decided he was right, once he had adopted a position based on moral principles, he would never change his mind. Abraham Lincoln hated compromise over the most important issues because he didn't believe you could compromise over the right of free elections or the preservation of the Union. And so for that reason I say this, and I don't mean this in a pejorative sense or an accusatory sense, merely as a statement of fact. Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis are the two greatest killers in American history. And I say that because each man was willing to witness and order the death of 620,000 fellow Americans to prove their point, to win their point. Abraham Lincoln once said, the contest now begun must be tried by war. I'm absolutely convinced that Abraham Lincoln would have been willing to endure one million, one million casualties to win the war. If Davis had that many men to spare and send to their deaths, Jefferson Davis would have sent a million men to their deaths to vindicate the rights of the states to secede from the Union. And Abraham Lincoln would have sent a million men to their death in order to preserve the sanctity of free elections and to keep the Union together. Uh, and so, in that way, each man was so dedicated to his cause that the only way the Civil War could have possibly come to a conclusion was through blood and violence and death until one side crushed the other. So don't have this image in your mind of kind, kind little grandfatherly Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's orders were clear to Grant in 1864, go out and kill them. Uh, th those aren't Lincoln's words, but, but that was his sentiment to Grant. Lincoln had always said our objective shouldn't be the rebel capitals or this maneuver or that. Uh, Lincoln's view was find the rebel army and destroy it. And how do you destroy an army but to kill and wound it and put it out of action? And so here were the two men in the spring of 1865. Davis is in his capital in Richmond, and things have not gone well for the South for some time. Things are going well for Lincoln. So he leaves his White House in March 1865 to be with the army at the end. Jefferson Davis receives word on April 2nd from Lee that the Union is coming. I can't hold Petersburg anymore, and that means Richmond will fall tonight. Davis writes back, and I'm paraphrasing essentially, are you sure? And Lee writes back, yes, I'm sure. Davis says, are you really, really sure? Because this is going to be inconvenient. There are valuables to pack up and things to do and documents to, to take. Lee receives that note from Davis and crumples it up in his hand and tosses it to the ground. And they got along well during the war and says, I am sure I gave him proper warning. And then he sends another message to Davis that says, I'm sending a courier to you to lead you out of the city to the safety of my army. Uh, I would write more, but I can't because at this moment I now am in the presence of the enemy. Davis decided Lee meant it. So he packed up the cabinet and the documents and the railroad train, and, and this makes the point, and I won't summarize the Davis journey because it, it, it's in the book. The story of the escape of Jefferson Davis is not the story of a man who's running away to save his life. He was prepared to die. The story of his final six weeks journey is of a man who didn't want, want to give up hope, who wanted to keep the Civil War going on, who didn't want to surrender, who wanted to keep going deeper and deeper into the South to reform the Confederacy. When Davis escaped, Lee's army had not surrendered. Joe Johnston's army in North Carolina was still there to fight. Kirby Smith's army was west of the Mississippi in Texas. And so Davis thought he could create a new southern empire deeper to the south and the west. And so the entire story of his journey as his entourage of several thousand shrinks week by week, several thousand, several hundred. Then at the very end, six weeks later, it's Jefferson Davis, his wife, and four children, and 20 or 30 personal guards. Uh, it took a long time for Davis to realize the war was going to have to come to an end and he would have to escape. At one point during a council of war, most of the colonels and generals said, we can't fight anymore. And Jefferson Davis rebuked them. He was angry. He said, well, if you believe that, why are you even still here? Implying, if you're not with me, you should, why didn't, why don't you run away? 
And they said, we are here for one reason, and that is to save you and your wife and your children. And some of them told him, we will not fight any more Union soldiers. We'll fight no more battles. But we will fight to the death to save your life and to save the lives of your children and to save the life of your wife. That is the only reason we are still with you. Davis realized it was lost. He knew that he was now named by his arch enemy, the new president, Andrew Johnson. They despised each other for decades. Johnson named him as one of the murderers of Lincoln and put up $100,000 reward on Davis's head. Davis was deciding what to do. He had said on the morning of May 10th he would get on his horse and ride with two or three men, possibly flee to Cuba, Bermuda, Mexico, Florida. He went to bed dressed in a suit of Confederate gray and boots. His horse was saddled nearby with his pistols in the holsters. But before he could leave that morning, two Union cavalry units converged on his camp and started shooting and killing each other because the rumor was Davis was traveling with six to eight million dollars in gold coins. And these soldiers wanted that gold. And after the capture, they searched Davis's personal baggage. They even searched the trunks of his little children and his wife, throwing out the children's clothes and toys and dresses, convinced there was gold there, but there wasn't. And so now Davis is captive. He's taken to prison. Lincoln is dead in his coffin in Washington. The White House funeral has happened, and now he's on the road heading home. And so these are really their, their final journeys, and I'll just summarize the points very briefly. Davis's case, he's in prison for two years, but then they realize we've got to do what Lincoln said. Don't kill him, let him go. If we kill him, the South will rise. If we put him on trial and he's acquitted, then the South was right all along. So Davis is released in 1867. Lincoln goes on this 1,600-mile railroad journey, which I think is the saddest, most elaborate public event ever in American history. And ultimately, the message of that journey is that Lincoln is transformed from mortal man to America's secular saint. And here's why. I'm convinced that the country didn't view that train as just bringing home the body of the fallen president. Thousands and thousands of dead men never came from the war. Their bodies were buried in anonymous graves. They were obliterated by cannon fire. And so for many people, there was never a funeral at home with the loved one. And so I'm convinced the American people viewed that train as bringing home not only Abraham Lincoln, but every father, every son, every brother, every husband lost in the war. And that's why I think it resonates to the present day. In the case of Jefferson Davis, it took a little longer for him to go on his final journey. And I, I, I'll close with, with what happened to him. I realized that few people recall Jefferson Davis survived Abraham Lincoln in the end of the Civil War by almost a quarter of a century. But who remembers Jefferson Davis at all? Uh, here's one, one little example. 2009 was the bicentennial of the birth of Abraham Lincoln. There were coins, stamps, a hundred books, symposiums, television documentaries, and, and prior to leaving office, uh, President Bush and Laura Bush held the first black tie dinner ever held in the White House in Abraham Lincoln's honor. How many of you remember another event? Does anyone here know the significance of June 3rd, 2008? Like I'll say it once more, June 3rd, 2008. Raise your hand if you know what that date means. There's one man in back. That is the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the birthday of Jefferson Davis. There were no White House dinners, there were no coins, there were no stamps, there were no national symposia. He is truly the forgotten man, but not so in the quarter century after the war. He tries to decide what to do. He's lost, he has no money, his lands are gone. He fails in business. But then Robert E. Lee dies in 1870, and Lee had been wanting to write his memoirs. And Davis writes to his private secretary, Burton Harrison, it occurs to me that before I am pulled into the grave, I wish to write a history of the struggle of our people. And so he gets involved in Confederate memorial activities. He sponsors historical societies. He encourages his colonels and generals to write books and memoirs. He receives guests to talk about the war. And ultimately, he does his own memoirs, which no one reads today, 
Then he's preparing for death. It's 1886. He's old. He's frail. He survived death many times. He's been sick through most of his life. He's living on the Mississippi Gulf. And he receives an invitation to go to Montgomery, Alabama to commemorate uh, or to, to uh, dedicate the uh, monument to the war dead of Alabama. And he agrees to do it and thinking, oh, it's just another one of those little talks I give to the veterans. Uh, nothing big, nothing important. Then he realizes that thousands of people are waiting along the railroad tracks. He gets to Montgomery and there are thousands, tens of thousands waiting. Women in black rush up to him. These are Confederate widows from 22 years ago. Women in black rush up to him and lay hands on him and they collapse and pass out. Old men missing arms or legs and old gray uniforms touch him and they begin trembling uncontrollably. Then Davis speaks and he says, I'm at the spot where I took the oath of office 25 years ago. Then you were filled with hope, now tears and regret. And then he thinks of the young boys killed in the war because at the end the Confederacy it was putting 13, 14, 15 year olds in the field. Davis says, I see them now. Some of those boys did not even weigh as much as their packs and rifles on their backs weighed. And then he comes up with this metaphor that I think makes this the most influential speech he ever gives in terms of his legacy. He says, they were the seed corn of the South. And that image of the young crops that never came to fullness breaks the heart of the audience. Northern papers say we've never seen people shout and scream like this. Uh, the South is aflame. Who knows where this will end? Then Davis meets thousands of ex-soldiers, and they rush to his spot, and his wife says later, don't meet those old men. They're going to kill you. They're going to shake your hand. They're going to lift you in the air. You're going to die. Twenty-two years after the Civil War, Jefferson Davis says, if I am to die, it would be my pleasure to die in the presence of my Confederate Army. My Confederate Army. It was 22 years ago. Um, he dies a couple years later in New Orleans. He's then buried temporarily, but he's sent to Richmond, which Verena chooses as the burial spot, really to reign forever over the dream of the lost cause. He's put aboard a train, just like Abraham Lincoln's. People hold up signs that have the same words that people held up for Lincoln years before. Our chief has fallen. We mourn our chief. He suffered for us. Bring him home. Magnificent funeral. And then here's the apex or the climax of the legacy of Jefferson Davis. His monument is put up on Richmond Avenue. 350,000 people attend. 100,000 attended Lincoln's funeral. Children pulling 700-foot-long ropes drag the monument to its dedication site. And then on that day, uh, the 60-foot the, the column is there uh, with the Confederate mottos, uh, Deo Vindinci, God will, will vindicate. Uh, Juris Civitatum, for the rights of the states, and Pro Aris et Focus, which was really the sentimental, true motto of the Confederacy, for hearth and home. And on that day, Jefferson Davis's followers believed that his name, like Abraham Lincoln's, would go down forever in our history as one of the great Americans. And how wrong they turned out to be, because of course we know now that the 20th century came to belong to Abraham Lincoln and not Jefferson Davis. And uh, the Confederate past is quite controversial today as we enter the sesquicentennial. We all know that the governor of Virginia got in hot water last year when he proposed there be a Confederate History Month. We know that some people ask that the Confederate flag no longer be displayed. And, and I would close by saying for the, for the sesquicentennial year and for the next four years, it's very important that we remember all of the Civil War. And I think if you're going to think about the Civil War, you've got to study the Army of the North, and the Army of the South. You can't just focus on the men of the war. You have to focus on the women of North and South. You can't just focus on the whites. You have to study the lives of the slaves. You have to study the lives of the free men and the free blacks and those who joined the Union Army and fought valiantly for the cause. And so I began this book as a Lincoln man and ended as a Lincoln man, but I'm very happy that I went on this journey uh, with his counterpart, Jefferson Davis, who I came to realize no one thinks about anymore. Thanks very much.
Uh, you probably notice we've gone a little bit over time. Our, our next speaker is running a bit late, but I'm told he's just arrived. So we probably have a couple of minutes for questions um, until our next presentation. Thank you. The question was, did other writers influence me about the Civil War? Well, Bruce Catton certainly did. But I have other writers I like a lot, like, like Truman Capote, Doris Goodwin, Walt Whitman. Not so much particular Civil War writers, aside from Bruce Catton. Any other? Oh, he asked, what, what's the signature of my writing, or what is my writing like? What I try to do is take the reader back in time to imagine that it didn't have to happen that way, that Lincoln didn't have to die, Davis didn't have to be caught, things didn't have to happen necessarily the way they ended up happening. And th I guess my signature is I rely terribly on going to the places where things happened, on original books, artifacts, photographs, prints, works of art. I think a sense of time and place is what makes history come alive. So I, I try to do that. What was Mary Todd Lincoln like? It's tough to describe it briefly. I would say read Michael Burlingame's great two-volume book on Abraham Lincoln that came out a couple years ago, one of the five best books on Lincoln's ever published. One side of Mary Lincoln, girlish, charming, coquettish, well-educated, savvy, and loyal to Union and great sympathy for the soldiers of the war. The other Mary Lincoln, mentally unbalanced, vicious, cruel, and all the other things I say in my book. Uh, they grew apart during the White House years, and, and that's probably the best summary I can say. You mentioned the importance of artifacts in your work. Is there any one piece that you wish you would have found that you haven't found? Well, well there's one piece I wish I would have found. Uh, I would have liked to have found the Colt revolver that Sergeant Boston Corbett used to shoot and kill John Wilkes Booth. Uh, Corbett possessed that revolver for a few weeks. It was stolen from him. Someone offered $1,000 for it at the time, and he wouldn't sell it. It belonged to the government. It was issued by the government. Now, the interesting thing about Colt revolvers is they all have a unique serial number. And so it's my opinion that unless someone would, would be so foolish as to actually throw in the garbage in the last 150 years a valuable Colt pistol, someone out there in America actually owns the pistol used to kill John Wilkes Booth and has no idea what it is because its identity has now been lost. I would have liked to have found that relic. Yes, uh, the question is a movie. Manhunt is being made into a nine-part, nine-hour HBO miniseries, which is being produced by David Simon, who does Treme, uh, who did The Wire, Homicide, Life in the Street. Uh, half the scripts have been written now, so I imagine, I hope it will be on TV within a couple years. And then um, Kevin Bacon and I have sold a television series based on the extended Booth family. Uh, I, I suppose it will be like the Tudors, uh, but set in the 19th century American stage. Uh, that's not an assassination-focused film. That's about American theater and American life. Uh, so th those, are, those are the uh, film projects. Anyone else? What? I only heard what was something Civil War. Oh, my favorite part of the Civil War? Uh, I would have to say the end. <laughs> because it, it's, you know, it's a regrettable war. Uh, perhaps it's not a war that could have been easily avoided as the First World War should have been avoided. One of the most wasteful things ever. Uh, I suppose the end, because finally that's when the killing stopped, the dying stopped. It, it, it's the saddest event in American history. Uh, it's a tragedy that it happened. Uh, the seeds for it were sown long before Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis were men. Uh, uh, that's a whole separate subject of, of mine, uh, why I think that Thomas Jefferson is the worst hypocrite in American history who caused death for a hundred for years. Uh, uh, my view on Jefferson, I can't even get into now. But it's so easy to speak of—it's so easy to speak of liberty and freedom and equality. <laughs>
and earn your living on the backs of the people you own. Uh, other men freed their slaves. He could have, and he didn't, and he enjoyed having them. Uh, I think I'll stop with that because I'm delaying the next program. Thanks very much. Thank you.